Procedamus. A little Latin lingo. Okay. The second, uh, another range of concerns that I think indicates the error of this approach uh, at a somewhat presuppositional level is for us to consider the firmament uh, in Genesis chapter 1. This is a short and simple argument, but if you will think about when the firmament was set up, it's not part of the original creation. Because in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. And for 24 hours that's how it was. There was the light of the Holy Spirit shining between heaven and earth so that heaven and earth could see each other. That is the configuration on the first day. The Spirit is over the waters. The Spirit gives forth light. Earth can see heaven. Heaven can see earth. And they're face to face. On the second day, God puts a firmament barrier between heaven and earth. And when you go outside and look, you see that. You see the blue sky. Now on the fourth day, God blows this firmament up, stretches it up like a tent, so that it includes all the sun, moon, and stars. Originally it was just a veil, then it becomes a tent. And I've discussed that in the Genesis 1 book at some length. But, in fact, if you want to understand redshift and all that stuff, I think that that outblowing of the universe on the fourth day is probably what gives us all these phenomena that uh, astronomers talk about. But that barrier is there and it's still there. You can't look up and see heaven. But the picture that we're given in the book of Revelation is that this firmament goes away and what we have is the new Jerusalem essentially between heaven and earth which is a shining light. It's said to have starlight about it and it is now the place between heaven and earth and these are once again face to face. Now what I've said that what does the Bible do with this? Well, again, we would have to spend a good deal of time, which we don't have, tracing through the veils in the Bible. But if you will, veils have to do with the place between the man and the woman, which is removed in connection with marriage. And that is quite explicitly said in connection with Rebecca's veil in Genesis chapter 24. Uh, it's interesting to read that. At the end of Genesis chapter 24, Rebecca is showing up on with all these uh, camels and donkeys and whatnot, and she says, who's that guy over there? And the servant, Eliezer, I guess, says, that's your husband-to-be. And so she put her veil on. She wasn't wearing it ordinarily. These weren't like BMOs, you know, over in Saudi Arabia. You know what a BMO is? Black moving objects. <laughs> that's what the GIs call those, those Saudi women. <laughs> Black moving objects. They, they weren't veiled like that in the ancient world, but she puts this veil on just like a woman does on her wedding day. If, 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 your, girl, if your wife wore a veil uh, over her face and then you lift it up, that's exactly what happened there. And it's, it's lifted up or removed in connection with the wedding. And then there is a consummation of the wedding later on. Well, this is directly tied to these veils in the tabernacle. Tabernacle uh, has a set of veils that the Holy of Holies is the highest heaven, the holy place is the firmament heaven, and this altar of bronze is the mountain on the earth beneath. Uh, the stars are in here, this sevenfold lampstand with these seven stars, but there's a veil here and a veil there, which are the expanded version of this original firmament veil. Well, these veils come down in the first century. They're torn, and uh, the, first, the, the New Testament gives us this marriage language, and it gives us a progression of a marriage, but it isn't over yet. And in terms of this marriage, so that we are finally face to face again with heaven, and this is symbolic language, of course, we have a betrothal period which runs from Adam to the cross, 
And because we have played the harlot, and you have to give me permission here to discuss something that's quite clear in the law, but I don't have time to show it to you. We've lost our virginity because of our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is our tokens of virginity. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 22. And that's part of what the cross does, is it covers our sin. So that we are restored to virginity, judicially speaking, by the blood of Jesus. And then the wedding ceremony begins when the veil of the temple is rent. That's where it begins. And the wedding ceremony runs from Pentecost to Cataclysm. And during that time, the bride is formed. When does the marriage feast start? Well, a marriage feast comes after the ceremony, but before all the guests go home, okay? And you consummate the marriage. When does the marriage feast start? The marriage feast starts in AD 70. That's real clear in the, uh, in, in the, in the parables. I mean, that's laid out in Matthew, uh, chapter 22. Matthew 22, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He sends out these slaves. The slaves uh, are mistreated, and so he burns their city down. And then they compel other people to come in, and the wedding hall is filled with guests. And then there is a judgment that takes place after a while. Similarly, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb begins after the city is destroyed in chapter 17 and 18. So that we're in the marriage feast now, but the marriage feast is not the end of the story. There's a divorce that's going to take place in the last judgment, a divorce of that part of the bride that's unfaithful, and then there's the married life, which runs from the last judgment forever and ever. See, everything is in, implied here, and part of the proof of that is that this physical firmament between heaven and earth is still there. The symbolic firmaments have been removed, but the physical firmament is still there. What is the... I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to express this, and I have an eye on the clock, and I don't want to run too fast so that you just completely miss the point. Removing these veils, the of the tabernacle represents something. Okay, It represents removing the firmament that was made on the second day. If you say that the firmament made on the second day is going to be there forever and ever, this world here that we're on right now is going to be forever and ever. There's no last judgment. There's no transfiguration of the construction of the universe. There's no removal of the veil uh, or, or transfiguration of the starry universe so that it's no longer a barrier between heaven and earth. That's not going to happen. The way things are right now is going to go on forever. You've got a problem. That would make, you could argue that if God had made the universe that way in the first place on day one, but he didn't. He introduced this separation for a time. It would seem, because all the other separations are for a time. And then the time of separation ends. Um, the removal of the symbolic veils has to mean that. You say, well, this, the physical veil between heaven and earth, that's going to be forever. But... The veils in the tabernacle, they come down so that God and man are face to face in an invisible spiritual way, but not in a visible way. Well, what? That's a, an arbitrary way to deal with it. What does it mean? The tabernacle and the temple are themselves models of the, of the universe, as we'll see in a moment. And these veils are models of the firmament between heaven and earth and these veils are taken down, what can this mean except that eventually the physical veil is going to be removed between heaven and earth and once again we'll be face to face. 
because we were once. Now God does this separation and coming back together again thing in the Bible all the time. He does it with you and me. Okay? He does it with Adam and Eve. He gets them married and then he leaves. Then he comes back 24 hours later and they've blown it. Okay? But there's a separation and then a coming back together again. That's the whole course of history here. It's not supposed to be that heaven and earth are separated forever and ever. And the whole meaning of removing the veils in the tabernacle, excuse me, in the temple, which was started in the tabernacle, means that, okay? It can't mean anything else. Well, uh, that's the kind of argument that I would try to spend time with with somebody who um, was holding these views. I, I think we, maybe we should move on, maybe if that's not entirely clear to you. The Bible gives us this progress of marriage, okay? The, the bride is formed up in her initial form in the apostolic age. The marriage supper begins, okay, uh, in A.D. 70. But that's, the marriage supper doesn't go on forever, okay? There's a marriage life that comes afterwards. Uh, let's look to another set of considerations, and that's the meaning of the temple. I've already mentioned this. Okay, prepare to write things down if you're one of the students. There are seven fundamental aspects of the tabernacle and the temple. Seven things that they mean. And uh, you can pick up my book, Through New Eyes. You can pick up Vern Poitras' book, The Shadow of Christ and the Law of Moses. And uh, it'll give you some of this stuff. Seven things. First, it means the physical cosmos. It is a microcosm of the cosmos. The rituals in the temple are microcrons of human history. Those sacrifices take you from creation to consummation in a microcron. We're not talking about microcrons. We're talking about microcosm right now. The universe represents the physical cosmos. Just one verse there, Isaiah 66, verse 10, which I'm staggering through trying to find. Excuse me, Isaiah 66, verse 1. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Worthiness a house you could build for me, and where is a place I could rest? Throne and footstool are heaven and earth. But you see in the temple, throne and footstool are the Ark of the Covenant. And the cover that is above it with the cherubim and God enthroned on the wings of the cherubim. That's heaven and earth. And this is temple language. Throne and footstool are represent the physical cosmos. So that's the first thing the tabernacle and temple represent in our list. We could list these in any order. Second, they represent the body politic of Israel. They represent the body politic of Israel, all the various features of the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, represent various aspects of the society. And you know that the, the uh, well, uh, we won't spend time there. Uh, third, they represent the individual human person. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The individual person is signified by it. Your heart, your emotions, your stomach, the altar is your stomach. The altar is hollow and food is put inside of it. And it digests the food with that fire that's inside there. That's If you want to take a humaniform version of it, uh, the lamp of the body is the eye. Okay, The lamp stand represents the eye. So the table of incense represents your nose, so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's a human, it's humaniform. All temples are, pagan or Christian. But uh, the Bible, it is too. Uh, for since it represents the individual human person, the tabernacle and the temple represent the Messiah. Of course, that's familiar enough. John chapter 2, Jesus speaks of the temple of his body. He tabernacles among us. Number five, they represent the local church. So that you can make an application from these architectures to this church here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 
And it represents the universal church. Ephesians 2.21 The whole church is a temple that's being built on a foundation. And then seventh, uh, the seventh dimension of it is that they are uh, architectural structures and places of worship. Okay. Now, why do I go through all this? Well, the tabernacle undergoes a death and resurrection to become the temple. The temple undergoes a death and resurrection to become the church. Okay. In the book of Samuel proceeds. The book of Samuel starts with the tearing down of the tabernacle because of the abomination it causes desolation. These priests are seizing the sacrifices of God and they're fornicating with the deaconesses. Okay, and these are abominations and God says, I've had it, I'm out of here. I'm going to go visit the Philistines for a while. And so he leaves and it's torn apart. And when the ark comes back from the Philistines, it is not put back in the tabernacle. They have a separate shrine for the ark and a separate shrine for the tabernacle. And you know what death is in the Bible. Death is to be ripped in half. That's what happens to those animals when Abraham makes the covenant in Genesis 15. The tabernacle is ripped in half, and half of it is with the ark, and the other half is with the rest of the tabernacle. And this continues to be in place for about 100 years. Okay. In David's day, David brings the ark up to Jerusalem and he sets up worship there. The, the rest of the tabernacle continues to be at Gibeah. Okay. And they got two high priests. And so the body politic of Israel is still rent in half. Um, it's not united. The worship is still torn into two parts. There's still a certain amount of death until the new temple is built, which is a glorified and transfigured form of the tabernacle, and everything is put back into, into place again. Now that's death, and remaining under a time of death, and being torn apart, and then being put back together again. Okay, That is the course of the book of Samuel. At the end of the book of Samuel, David has a site for the temple. So the book starts with the tearing down the tabernacle, it ends with the temple site. Okay. Now, what happens to this one? Well, it's torn apart in the days of Nebuchadnezzar because of the people's sins. They commit the abomination that causes desolation. That's described to us in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11. Ezekiel sees all these abominations going on, and he sees God pack up and move out. And God's uh, chariot moves out across to the um, Mount of Olives, and then, which is what Jesus does when he leaves the temple. He goes to the Mount of Olives and says, I've had it with you guys. And that's what happens in Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11. And then it goes off to Babylon to be with the people. So the temple is torn down. And it comes back to life again in Ezekiel's invisible temple. Okay, in the book of Ezekiel, the physical temple is torn down. And in the last eight chapters, nine chapters of Ezekiel give us a vision of the restoration from exile in the form of this new order using this architectural imagery of a new Jerusalem and a new temple. Well, what happens to that? Well... It's torn apart. It gets, a, it, it's get made, it gets made. That invisible and symbolic temple in Ezekiel is given a partial external form uh, when the Jews come back from exile and in Herod's temple. And then it's torn down and the New Jerusalem replaces it. Okay. Now, these death and resurrection, death and transfiguration events that happen to these structures mean these seven things, okay? They mean these seven things. Running backwards, the temple is a place of worship. Well, each time the temple is torn down, dies and resurrects, when it comes back to life again, the worship changes. You know, the Chronicles gives you all these additional things about worship that were not part of the tabernacle. All the music, all the musical instruments, 24 courses of priests. Now we not only have a high priest and priest, we got high priest, chief priests and priests. All that's in Chronicles. Really boring. First Chronicles. All these lists of all these guys, gatekeepers, on the par bar and all these other places. Who knows what on earth they're talking about. 
But there it is. It's new. And then when you get to Ezekiel, there are new rituals and constructions in Ezekiel's temple. The altar looks radically different in Ezekiel's visionary temple. And there are differences in terms of how the worship is performed. And now, when that's torn down and replaced, now we have the new covenant, and the worship changes again. We don't offer animal sacrifices. Okay? I don't get unclean if I kiss my wife and she's on her period. All those things that made you unclean in the Old Testament, that's all gone. Okay? Uh, but each transformation changes the worship. They change the way the church is put together. They change, they symbolize the body politic of Israel undergoing sociological changes. Okay? And they carry with it the implication, you see, of the individual physical body of an individual person undergoing physical transformation. And they carry with it the implication that the physical cosmos will undergo a physical transformation and transfiguration. Okay? The New Testament speaks of these things. The Messiah underwent such a transformation. The Messiah died and came back to life in a transfigured way. He's a temple. When the temple is rebuilt, he comes back in a more glorified way. That's what happened with Jesus. In Revelation chapter 20, and Max King has got some decent ideas along these lines. Uh, Israel's death becomes a resurrected church. In fact, the church is formed up. He doesn't see this quite as clearly, but the church is formed up in the apostolic age out of Jew and Greek. And then that body dies and comes to life again in a glorified church form in Revelation chapter 20. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So, it means the church. As individuals, pastors face this kind of thing in their lives. That the fire will come and test whether you are working with gold, silver, and precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. You don't have any choice what you work with, but the pastor will be preserved whichever kinds of things he's building with. We said that the tabernacle represents local churches. Well, you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you'll find tabernacle and temple imagery used throughout there for those seven churches and Jesus says I'm coming to each one of you and I'm going to check you out and transform you change you it follows that the universal church as a temple has the same transfiguring experience in store for her this is what always happens to churches this is what always happens to temples and if we're the temple then we're headed for transfiguration not just going on forever and ever and if the temple is a and the tabernacle are models of the universe, the universe is headed for transfiguration. It's not going to go on forever. None of these ever do. It is a failure to take into account everything that the temple and tabernacle mean uh, that can enable King to say, well, it, it, you know, the body politic aspect undergoes death and resurrection, but this doesn't mean anything for the physical cosmos. No, it most definitely does. It means all these things. You can't start slicing out some aspects of the meaning. Uh, if you deny that what is true for one temple meaning is true for all temple meanings, you run into serious presuppositional problems with the doctrine of the Trinity. The equal ultimacy of the three and the one in humanity is part of our faith. Whatever corporate humanity goes through, individuals go through. And whatever individuals go through, corporate humanity goes through. We may not understand this very well, but it's true because God is three in one. What's true of the persons of God is true of God. What's true of individuals is true of societies. Uh, and the second problem that you're going to have is the connection of humanity to the cosmos. If human beings go through these things, the cosmos goes through it for two reasons. One, we're made of dust. And second of all, we eat the world. You're always eating the world. Now, it's a little Schmemann says that, but it's still true. What do we eat? Well, what we eat, what we will be eating in a few minutes. Sounds good, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and break. Eat now. Um,
The food we eat is made out of earth, air, fire, and water. Okay? Or you can call them by different names, but you get earth, and you have to have water, and you have to have oxygen or carbon dioxide, and you've got to have sunlight. And that makes food. And that is the, the four parts of the world. When we eat it, we're taking it into ourselves. We eat the world. Ultimately, everything becomes food. Maybe animals eat it, and we eat the animals. Sooner or later, we're going to eat it. I think that's great. We, we are in charge of the world. We eat the world, and the world travels with us. What happens to us is going to happen to the world. We're carrying along. Okay? So if we're going to have a transfiguring experience, the world's going to have a transfiguring experience. Uh, all of these things go together in the Bible. They're not separated up into these different categories where you can say, well, resurrection has to do with the change of society in A.D. 70. Sure it does. But it, therefore, it doesn't have anything to do with the physical universe of the physical body. No, no, no. It has also to do with those things, as the church has always said. So King and others are right to point to the death and resurrection of the body of God's people in apostolic history. That's true. The church undergoes death and resurrection at that point in time. That's one event. They are wrong to assert that this is the only meaning of the temple and its history. Now, the next, we've got two more things to do. And we're done. I'm going to talk about the bride. And we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 20. I think Revelation 20 is a good proof against this view. So I'm saving it to last. It's such an easy passage that we don't need to spend any time with it. Okay. In terms of biblical imagery, we are called brothers and sons. We are also called a bride. And this imagery in the Bible is consistent in its difference. As individuals, we are sons and brothers. You ladies are sons and brothers as individuals. Okay? We are all brothers. We're not really brothers and sisters. I don't know if the Bible ever talks about this way, only rarely. It just talks about the brethren. It talks about the sons of Israel. And of course, you know that some people like Nigel Lee would say that because it says sons of Israel, therefore women didn't come to Passover. Well, he's just plain flat out dead wrong on that. Because sons of Israel includes everybody. Okay? But we are called sons and brothers as individuals. I'm a son. I'm a son. You're a son. You're a son. You're a son. We're all sons. Together, we are the bride. I'm not the bride. You're not a bride, you're not a bride, but together we're a bride. Bride imagery is corporate. Sonship, brotherhood imagery, is distributive, individualistic. Collectively, we are a brotherhood. Corporately, we are a bride. Individually, now, the importance of this is to say that the transformation of the bride is not something that happens individually by individually. Okay. It's something that happens corporately. Individually, we experience death and resurrection at our new birth, which is connected with baptism. And connected uh, in the, the meaning of it is what baptism means. And uh, as Reformed people, we believe God works miracles through the sacraments, so we're not surprised if God actually regenerates at the time the people are baptized. He may regenerate at other times. He's free to do it, but the Bible links them up, so uh, we see the Spirit actually doing something then. And people fight forever about what it is exactly the Spirit does, but something happens. Okay. Uh, individually, this is true of us. And we are being progressively formed into the bride, and the bride has to go through what the groom went through, Suffering, resurrection, and transfiguration. It's her privilege. The groom who has suffered, resurrected, and been transfigured is now going to have a bride who has done the same thing. And this happens, first of all, in Revelation 14 and in Revelation 20. And let me just show you this. This is where we get into Revelation, finally. It's been waiting for all day. In Revelation, and the, the, if you want to
to see a little bit more if you don't have this little book, Brief Reader's Guide to Revelation. It's brief and it's a reader's guide to Revelation and it'll give you a little bit more on this. Um, at the beginning of chapter 14, it says the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion with 144,000. And then in chapter 15, uh, there, uh, it says uh, in verse 2, I saw a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who come off victorious from the beast and from his image standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. This is the same group of people. Uh, and what has happened? Well, they were on the earth, now they're in heaven, and in the meantime is that they got harvested. This is the harvest of the first fruits church. And the harvest takes place as a harvest of wheat and of grapes. And there's sickles here, and you know the passage, people throw this to the last judgment half the time. Uh, some people say this is a judgment of the wicked. Chilton tries to divide it up and say that the bread is one thing and the grapes are another. I don't think you can do that. I think that bread and wine are symbols of the church. And that both of these are symbols of the harvesting of the first fruits church, particularly the harvest of the grapes. Uh, the grapes are harvested outside the city, which is exactly where Jesus was crucified and the book of Hebrews tells us to go outside the city. The wine press is trodden outside the city and the grape blood fills the land. And what happens when blood covers the land? Blood calls for what? Vengeance. Blood calls up the blood avenger. And the next thing that happens in Revelation is all these these bowls are poured out, see, on Babylon. So Babylon has massacred the saints. We don't know exactly how and when this took place. But Babylon has massacred the saints. The blood of the saints covers the land. That's a lot of blood and that's a lot of vengeance. And then the vengeance is called down. That's the progression of events here. Well, that is the great tribulation here. This harvesting of the saints. What happens to them? Well, in, they go to join those who are waiting. <clears throat> in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we see Jesus, the first human being ever to go into heaven, he goes up to the throne. And then in chapter 6, we see the souls who had been slain because of the word of God, not because of the testimony of Jesus. Here it says the word of God and their testimony, which means Old Testament saints. And they say, hey, how come we don't get to get a, go to heaven too? We thought that when Jesus went to heaven, we would go along. How come we have to stay down here in Abraham's bosom under the altar? It's nice down here, but it's better up there. Specifically what they say, how long is it going to be before you avenge our blood? And they're told to wait a while because some more people needed to be added to them. Added to them. Well, in chapter 7, we see who those people are. 144,000 harvested, saved out of Israel, plus a mixed multitude from the Gentiles are going to be added to them. And then these people go through some difficulties here uh, during the apostolic age, which is portrayed as these trumpets. And they're attacked by Judaizers and all this kind of stuff. And then in chapter 14, they're harvested. And that adds up the full number of those who are still waiting to go to heaven. Now, up in heaven, there are no human beings in heaven yet, except for Jesus. We have the throne. We have the throne here. And around the throne, we have 24 thrones that have these 24 archangels on them. And I get, give you a brief tour of Revelation here. And out here, separated, are still the saints under the altar. Now, this is the temple in heaven. There are 24 archangelic acts in the book of Revelation. Each one of these angels gets off his throne, comes before the throne of God, leaves his crown, and he goes out and blows his trumpet or pours his bowl or does one of the 24 things that are listed. And by the time this is finished, all these thrones are empty and they're waiting for their new occupants. These people, are their full number is here and they're put out here on the sea of glass. But at this point, they don't go into heaven either. This is the late 1860s. We can peg these events historically. 
They're on the sea of glass, so they're on the other side of the firmament now. They've come up that far, but the temple here where God is and where these thrones are, they haven't entered that yet. It says, it says, verse, chapter 15, verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and His power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So now, now it's empty. Jesus is in here, of course, but no angels are in here. The angels have all come out. The last six bowl angels are out here getting ready to do their thing. The human beings are here, but they're not in here yet. The last judgments are, being, are going to be performed on Israel and the beast. And then, in chapter 20, Then at last I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. The souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God, New Testament saints here and Old Testament, testimony of Jesus and Word of God, and hadn't worshipped the beast. Now the saints occupy these thrones. Angels no longer rule the world, as it says in Galatians. Now the human beings take the throne. When did that happen? It happened in AD 70. Now King and these guys want to say this happened in AD 30, and that the millennium is from AD 30 to AD 70. There is no way. There's no way. Revelation says there aren't any human beings in heaven. They, they are waiting for it. They are waiting for the rest of the old covenant saints to join them the 144,000 in mixed multitude. That's still Old Testament language. Jew and Gentile coming out of Egypt. Those have to join them. They do join them in the Great Tribulation in the 1860s. Then they get out here and they wait. Heaven is empty except for God because the glory fills the place. Of course, that happened when the tabernacle and the temple were built too. And now the new temple is being built. The glory fills the place. These thrones are all empty now. The angels have left them. And then the saints take them. But that has to be an A.D. 70 event, folks. That can't happen earlier. Because the angels are the ones doing these judgments in Revelation. Angels are the administrators of the old creation. Angels are the ones passing judgments on the old creation in Revelation. And once these 24 angels have done their thing, and they've left their crowns in the big pile up here, the saints come in and take those chairs, more than just 24 now, and the saints get the crowns. That's what Galatians says. That's what it says in Acts. It says the old covenant was mediated by angels. We were under the authority of angels, but now we've grown up and become mature. And the Hebrews says soon we will move into these things. See, this, is, this reading Revelation this way puts Revelation right in line with everything else in the New Testament. It's what it repeatedly says. This is, to my mind, proof positive that the millennium starts in A.D. 70. And if that's true, then the last judgment is still ahead of us. The bride is formed up. The bride undergoes this death and resurrection. Now we are in a new period of time that recapitulates that history on a worldwide scale and does the same thing. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 20. Your notes... Uh, that I ran off for you has uh, a translation here. And I'll give you an, an, an analysis of this in the few moments that remain. First of all, uh, Verses 1 to 3, I don't have down here. Satan is thrown into the abyss and so that he cannot deceive the nations. Now, in, earlier in Revelation, he has deceived all the nations at one time. He cannot do that again until after the millennium is over. And then, in verses 4 to 6, we see uh, these Nazarites. I saw... He says, I saw basically two things. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. They has got to refer back to chapter 19 to this army of saints. And the judgment was given to them, 
And uh, that is to say, the souls of those beheaded on account of the testimony of Jesus and on account of the word of God. I can't, certainly can't show you this, but this phrase, testimony of Jesus, word of God, word of God and their testimony is used precisely in Revelation. Testimony of Jesus and word of God includes New Testament saints because they have the testimony of Jesus. Where the name Jesus is absent from the phrase, it refers to Old Testament saints. Okay. And that's the first thing he saw. I saw people on his thrones who had been beheaded. And I saw those who did not worship the beast or his image, did not receive the mark on their forehead and upon their hand. And they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live until a thousand years are completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection over these. The second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of the Messiah and will reign with him a thousand years. Now, the, the structure here is uh, in verse 4. He sees a heavenly judgment. I saw thrones and judgment was given to them. And those who died, those who were beheaded, are there. Then he sees faithful saints on the earth who didn't worship the beast. And they come to life and they reign. So there is heavenly judgment and earthly reign. These are two different things. Don't get them confused. Okay? So the entire passage looks like this. He sees heavenly judgment, which is not for the millennium, but forever. Sitting on these thrones is not just for a thousand years. That's in heaven and it goes on forever. Then he sees on the earth those who come to life again. And then there's a chiasm here. Uh, they're faithful priests. They reign for a millennium. The wicked don't get resurrected to the end. Uh, they reign for a millennium. And the faithful priests are also kings. Now, what kind of resurrection is this then? Well, it's the coming to life of the church. That's true enough. Who are these people uh, who had their heads cut off. What, does anybody know what that means? That's always curiosity. What does it mean that they were beheaded? I see that I've already walked through the material that I have here, so that's good. It means they're Nazarites, okay? You've got you to gotta have an accurate translation of Numbers chapter 5, but you look back at it, the Nazarite, we, we talk, talks about dedicating his hair, but in, in Hebrew it says it dedicates his head. And when he cuts his hair off, that means he's cutting his head off. And when he puts his hair on the altar, it means he's putting his head on the altar, which means his whole self. And so the expression that they're beheaded means that they were Nazarites, they were holy warriors to God, they were dedicated to him, and uh, that's what beheaded means there. I promise you that's what it means. Uh, you, you can try on other shoes for this one. Nothing else works. Okay, I got... I tried on all the other interpretations. They don't work. This, this one does. An army of holy warriors, okay, receiving their reward. And then, see, that, that they're the ones who go to heaven, and of course that's where we, we go too now. Blessed are the dead who die from now on, it says in chapter 14. From now on, when we die, we go to these thrones too. We aren't going to have to wait under the altar. Then we have the resurrection of the apostolic church which was martyred in the Great Tribulation and is resurrected to reign for a thousand years. And now you see we have got a time fix here. What happens next? I've got you this too. Verse 7, And whenever are completed the thousand years, loosed will be Satan out of his prison and will go to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, the Gog and Magog, that's prince and people. <clears throat> to gather them together into the war, of whom the number is like the sand of the sea. And they went up upon the breadth of the earth and encircled the camp of the saints, which is the, the beloved city. And fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceives them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where are the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night for the ages of the ages. Okay, I've got you an outline here. This is another chiastic structure here in terms of its implications. But uh, in the center of it is the attack on the uh, camp of the saints by those who come up. This event comes after the millennium, and it's still future to us. Um, now, what does Max King and 
those like him want to do with this passage. They want to say that the first resurrection is something that happens in connection with Pentecost, that the thousand years is a symbol for the 40 year period between AD 30 and AD 70, and that this loosening of Satan and this Gog and Magog attack is the same event as the Battle of Armageddon, the Battle of the Mountain of Festival Assembly uh, in chapter 19. The problem is Revelation won't let you do that. Okay, The progression of events won't let you do that. You don't have human beings in, in, in heaven until chapter 20. And human beings, except for Jesus, and human beings in heaven now, heaven is open, uh, is the beginning of this, which means this has to start in AD 70. There's no other way to read Revelation coherently, I promise you. I'm telling you the truth right now. It's true. Uh, and if, if that's, obviously, I have run very fast through this, so I hope you'll take this, which gives that argument in more detail. But I think that if you look at it, you will see that that progression, angels giving up their thrones, and then in AD 70, the church getting the thrones and the church coming back to life again after the tribulation, is a secure and unassailable way of reading Revelation. This is correct. And what it means is the first resurrection, the millennium, starts in AD 70. It's not some type of recapitulation here. It's not possible. Okay? It's not possible. And because of that, that means that there is a further development of the church, which is now over the entire earth, not just in the oikamene. Up till now, we've just been in the oikamene, but that's just a microcosm of the whole earth. Now, as Jesus says, go forth and make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you until the end of the age. What age is that? If it's all nations, it's not just the oikamene. All nations refers back to Genesis chapter 10, where you've got 70 nations. Any Jew would understand that. Discipling all nations means China, and uh, Indonesia and everywhere else need to be discipled and Jesus is with us until there is an end to that age. And that's what we see here. There is a final tribulation. There is a final uh, suffering, death and resurrection of the bride. There is a greater bride who is being formed now. Uh, we are also in the wedding feast, but in, during the feast more and more members of the bride are coming in and uh, then there will finally be this last great event. How much it is for a small season. The small season is just like what you have in here. In Revelation, it's just three and a half years, 42 months. A thousand years is not an appropriate symbol for 40 years of time. Uh, where does this millennium come from in the Bible? Millennium comes from basically two sources. Number one, People lived almost a thousand years before the flood. I think that's one place. And the other is from the time Solomon's temple was built until the destruction of the temple in AD 70 is, in Bible chronology terms, 1,000 years. And so you have 1,000 years of the temple rule in the Old Testament, which is then the foundation, remember, Symbolic language always refers back to past some. That thousand years is the foundation for this image of a thousand years for the new temple, which of course is much longer. But 40 years in the Bible is not the period of a kingdom reign. 40 years is the transition from Egypt to the new land. To, to say that the thousand years of temple reign in Revelation 20 is the same as the 40 years of transition out of Egypt doesn't make any sense. That's what King has to do. Doesn't work. The 40 years of transition precede the coming into the land and the new temple thousand year period. So that's that's what we have here and that being secure, I'm quite convinced of it, it's secure in my mind, and that means the thousand years are going to come to an end and shortly before that time or shortly after it actually uh, the millennium doesn't actually extend all the way to the second coming. It extends up to a short period before it. Uh, Satan is loosed, and there will be, a, and then there will be a great white throne judgment. I saw this judgment, and the uh, sea gives up its dead, and so forth and so on. Uh, 
death in Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, in AD 70, the Oikumen and the apostate Jews were thrown into the lake of fire. Still to come, Satan and death in Hades, which means all the wicked, all the wicked, are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So, my conclusion is, there is one other thing I wanted to point to. I'm going to do it super quick. One other thing. This is just completely changes gears here, but I, I got to mention it at least. In Matthew 24 and 25, most of that passage has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. But uh, the last of these parables of the talents says that after a long time, the master comes and settles accounts with those who were given the talents. The judgment that ensues and followed by the Son of Man coming in His glory and on His glorious throne, I submit has to be this same white throne judgment. And I have written on that, and if you're interested in my arguments for that, I'll give it to you. But we're really out of time. But I bring that up because the preterists, the, the super preterists, want to tell us you got to be real careful with these things that are said to be happening soon in this generation. Absolutely right. But they got to be careful and accurate with these things that are said to happen after a long time. After a long time doesn't mean 20 years, not in these prophetic contexts. In conclusion, while most New Testament prophecy directly concerns the events of the apostolic age, A, there are clear prophecies of a future event along the lines the church has always maintained, which we have looked at in Revelation 20 uh, and a few other places. And B, the apostolic age prophecies have a microchronic typological relation to these future events. So the, the things that are said about the destruction of Jerusalem here imply similar kinds of events will happen at the end. And... Uh, in a sense, the futurist way of reading Revelation is not entirely wrong because similar kinds of things will happen at the end. Uh, but the more accurate way of reading it, of course, is to understand that the immediate fulfillment was in the first century. Well, that I have managed to get through all these notes in the time allotted. I'm amazed. And uh, thank you for your attention. And the things that went way too fast, maybe we can discuss in the question and answer time. Thank you. Okay, let's stand. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you that you reveal yourself to us and that you reveal us to ourselves and that we can understand your plan for us and how you act. Uh, we ask that uh, these things that are difficult, uh, we would meditate on them and find some value in them and help us to sort through what's true and false. Bless us now as we prepare to eat and... Uh, fellowship for the rest of the day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's rearrange these tables real quickly.